Great Haitians by Charles Dickens Audiobook 12x30 I don't know why it should be a crack thing to be a brewer, but it is indisputable that while you cannot cannot possibly be genteel and bake, you may be as genteel as never was and brew. You see it every day. Yet a gentleman may not keep a public house, may he? Said I. Not on any account, returned Herbert, but a public house may keep a gentleman. Well. Mr. Havisham was very rich and very proud. So was his daughter. Miss Havisham was an only child. I hazarded. Stop a moment, I am coming to that. No, she was not an only child, she had a half-brother. Her father privately married again his cook, I rather think. I thought he was proud, said I. My good handle, so he was. He married his second wife privately, because he was proud, and in course of time she died. When she was dead, I apprehend he first told his daughter what he had done, and then the son became a part of the family, residing in the house you are acquainted with. As the son grew a young man, he turned out riotous, extravagant, undutiful altogether bad. At last his father disinherited him, but he softened when he was dying, and left him well off, though not nearly so well off as Miss Havisham take another glass of wine and excuse my mentioning that society as a body does not expect one to be so strictly conscientious in emptying one's glass, as to turn it bottom Charles Dickens' Elec book classics Great Expectations Great Expectations I had been doing this, in an excess of attention to his recital. I thanked him, and apologized. He said, not at all, and resumed. Miss Havisham was now an heiress and you may suppose was looked after as a great match. Her half-brother had now ample means again, but what with debts and what with new madness wasted them most fearfully again. There were stronger differences between him and her, than there had been between him and his father, and it is suspected that he cherished a deep and mortal grudge against her, as having influenced the father's anger. Now, I come to the cruel part of the story merely breaking off my dear Handel, to remark that a dinner napkin will not go into a tumbler. Why I was trying to pack mine into my tumbler, I am wholly unable to say. I only know that I found myself, with a perseverance worthy of a much better cause, making the most strenuous exertions to compress it within those limits. Again I thanked him and apologized, and again he said in the cheerfulest manner, not at all, I am sure and resumed. There appeared upon the scene say at the races, or the public balls, or anywhere else you like a certain man, who made love to Miss Havisham. I never saw him, for this happened five and twenty years ago, before you and I were, Handel, but I have heard my father mention that he was a showy man, and the kind of man for the purpose. But that he was not to be, without ignorance or prejudice mistaken for a gentleman, my father most strongly asseverates, because it is a principle of his that no man who was not a true gentleman at heart, ever was, since the world began, a true gentleman in manner. He says, no varnish can hide Charles Dickens' Elec book classics Great Expectations Great Expectations I thought of her having said, Matthew will come and see me at last when I am laid dead upon that table and I asked Herbert whether his father was so inveterate against her. It's not that, said he, but she charged him, in the presence of her intended husband, with being disappointed in the hope of fawning upon her for his own advancement, and, if he were to go to her now, it would look true even to him and even to her. To return to the man and make an end of him. The marriage day was fixed, the wedding dresses were bought, the wedding tour was Charles Dickens' Elec book classics Great Expectations Great Expectations which she received, I struck in, when she was dressing for her marriage. At twenty minutes to nine. At the hour and minute, said Herbert, nodding, at which she afterwards stopped all the clocks. What was in it?
further than that it most heartlessly broke the marriage off, I can't tell you, because I don't know. When she recovered from a bad illness that she had, she laid the whole place waste, as you have seen it, and she has never since looked upon the light of day. Is that all the story? I asked, after considering it. All I know of it, and indeed I only know so much, through piecing it out for myself, for my father always avoids it, and, even when Miss Havisham invited me to go there, told me no more of it than it was absolutely requisite I should understand. But I have forgotten one thing. It has been supposed that the man to whom she gave her misplaced confidence, acted throughout in concert with her half-brother, that it was a conspiracy between them, and that they shared the profits. I wonder he didn't marry her and get all the property, said I. He may have been married already, and her cruel mortification may have been a part of her half-brother's scheme, said Herbert. Mind. I don't know that. What became of the two men? I asked, after again considering the subject. They fell into deeper shame and degradation if there can be deeper unruin. Are they alive now? Charles Dickens' Elec book classics Great Expectations Great Expectations You said just now, that Estella was not related to Miss Havisham, but adopted. When adopted? Herbert shrugged his shoulders. There has always been an Estella, since I have heard of a Miss Havisham. I know no more. And now? Handel, said he, finally throwing off the story as it were, there is a perfectly open understanding between us. All that I know about Miss Havisham, you know. And all that I know, I retorted, you know. I fully believe it. So there can be no competition or perplexity between you and me. And as to the condition on which you hold your advancement in life namely, that you are not to inquire or discuss to whom you owe it you may be very sure that it will never be encroached upon, or even approached, by me, or by any one belonging to me. In truth, he said this with so much delicacy, that I felt the subject done with, even though I should be under his father's roof for years and years to come. Yet he said it with so much meaning, too, that I felt he as perfectly understood Miss Havisham to be my benefactress, as I understood the fact myself. It had not occurred to me before, that he had led up to the theme for the purpose of clearing it out of our way, but we were so much the lighter and easier for having broached it, that I now perceived this to be the case. We were very gay and sociable, and I asked him, in the course of conversation, what he was. He replied, a capitalist and insurer of ships. I suppose he saw me glancing about the room in search of some tokens of shipping, or capital, for he added, in the city. I had grand ideas of the wealth and importance of insurers of Charles Dickens' Elec book classics Great Expectations Great Expectations I shall not rest satisfied with merely employing my capital in insuring ships. I shall buy up some good life assurance shares, and cut into the direction. I shall also do a little in the mining way. None of these things will interfere with my chartering a few thousand tons on my own account. I think I shall trade, said he, leaning back in his chair, to the East Indies, for silks, shawls, spices, dyes, drugs, and precious woods. It's an interesting trade. And the profits are large. Said I. Tremendous said he. I wavered again, and began to think here were greater expectations than my own. I think I shall trade, also, said he, putting his thumbs in his waistcoat pockets, to the West Indies, for sugar, tobacco, and rum. Also to Ceylon, specially for elephants' tusks. You will want a good many ships, said I. A perfect fleet, said he. Quite overpowered by the magnificence of these transactions, I asked him where the ships he insured mostly traded to at present. I haven't begun insuring yet, he replied. I am looking about me. Somehow, 
that pursuit seemed more in keeping with Barnard's Inn. I said, in a tone of conviction, ah. Yes. I am in a counting house, and looking about me. Is a counting house profitable? I asked. Charles Dickens' Elec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations Yes, to you. Why, and no. Not to me. He said this with the air of one carefully reckoning up and striking a balance. Not directly profitable. That is, it doesn't pay me anything, and I have to keep myself. This certainly had not a profitable appearance, and I shook my head as if I would imply that it would be difficult to lay by much accumulative capital from such a source of income. But the thing is, said Herbert Pocket, that you look about you. That's the grand thing. You are in a counting house, you know, and you look about you. It struck me as a singular implication that you couldn't be out of a counting house, you know, and look about you, but I silently deferred to his experience. Then the time comes, said Herbert, when you see your opening. And you go in, and you swoop upon it and you make your capital, and then there you are. When you have once made your capital, you have nothing to do but employ it. This was very like his way of conducting that encounter in the garden, very like. His manner of bearing his poverty, too, exactly corresponded to his manner of bearing that defeat. It seemed to me that he took all blows and buffets now, with just the same air as he had taken mine then. It was evident that he had nothing around him but the simplest necessaries for everything that I remarked upon turned out to have been sent in on my account from the coffee house or somewhere else. Yet, having already made his fortune in his own mind, he was so unassuming with it that I felt quite grateful to him for not being Charles Dickens' Elec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations on a moderate computation, it was many months, that Sunday, since I had left Joe and Biddy. The space interposed between myself and them, partook of that expansion, and our marshes were any distance off. That I could have been at our old church in my old church-going clothes, on the very last Sunday that ever was, seemed a combination of impossibilities, geographical and social, solar and lunar. Yet in the London streets, so crowded with people and so brilliantly lighted in the dusk of evening, there were depressing hints of reproaches for that I had put the poor old kitchen at home so far away, and in the dead of night, the footsteps of some incapable impostor of a porter mooning about Barnard's Inn, under pretense of watching it, fell hollow on my heart. On the Monday morning at a quarter before nine, Herbert went to the counting house to report himself to look about him, too, I suppose and I bore him company. He was to come away in an hour or two to attend me to Hammersmith, and I was to wait about for him. It appeared to me that the eggs from which young insurers were hatched, were incubated in dust and heat, like the eggs of ostriches, judging from the places to which those incipient giants repaired on a Monday morning. Nor did the counting house where Herbert assisted, show in my eyes as at all a good observatory, being a back second floor up a yard of a grimy Charles Dickens Elec book classics Great Expectations Great Expectations I waited about until it was noon, and I went upon change, and I saw fluey men sitting there under the bills about shipping, whom I took to be great merchants, though I couldn't understand why they should all be out of spirits. When Herbert came, we went and had lunch at a celebrated house which I then quite venerated, but now believed to have been the most abject superstition in Europe and where I could not help noticing, even then, that there was much more gravy on the tablecloths and knives and waiters' clothes, than in the steaks. This collation disposed of at a moderate price, considering the grease, which was not charged for, we went back to Barnard's Inn and got my little portmanteau, and then took coach for Hammersmith. We arrived there at two or three o'clock in the afternoon, and had very little way to walk to M.R. Pocket's house. Lifting the latch of a gate, we passed direct into a little garden overlooking the river, where M.R. Pocket's children were playing about.
and unless I deceive myself on a point where my interests or prepossessions are certainly not concerned, I saw that Mr. and Mrs. Pocket's children were not growing up or being brought up, but were tumbling up. Mrs. Pocket was sitting on a garden chair under a tree, reading, with her legs upon another garden chair, and Mrs. Pocket's two nursemaids were looking about them while the children played. Mama, said Herbert, this is young Mr. Pib. Upon which Mrs. Pocket received me with an appearance of amiable dignity. Master Alec and Miss Jane, cried one of the nurses to two of the children, if you go a bouncing up against them bushes you'll fall over into the river and be drowned, and waddle your pa say Charles Dickens Alec book classics great expectations great expectations at the same time this nurse picked up Mrs. Pocket's handkerchief, and said, if that don't make six times you've dropped it, mum. Upon which Mrs. Pocket laughed and said, Thank you, flop son, and settling herself in one chair only, resumed her book. Her countenance immediately assumed a knitted and intent expression as if she had been reading for a week, but before she could have read half a dozen lines, she fixed her eyes upon me, and said, I hope your mama is quite well. This unexpected inquiry put me into such a difficulty that I began saying in the absurdest way that if there had been any such person I had no doubt she would have been quite well and would have been very much obliged and would have sent her compliments, when the nurse came to my rescue. Well, she cried, picking up the pocket handkerchief, if that don't make seven times. What are you a doing of this afternoon, mum? Mrs. Pocket received her property, at first with a look of unutterable surprise as if she had never seen it before, and then with a laugh of recognition, and said, Thank you, flop son, and forgot me, and went on reading. I found, now I had leisure to count them, that there were no fewer than six little pockets present, in various stages of tumbling up. I had scarcely arrived at the total when a seventh was heard as in the region of air, wailing dolefully. If there ain't baby, said Flopson, appearing to think it most surprising. Make haste up, Millers. Millers, who was the other nurse, retired into the house, and by degrees the child's wailing was hushed and stopped, as if it were a young ventriloquist with something in its mouth. MRS. Pocket read Charles Dickens' Alec book classics Great Expectations Great Expectations We were waiting, I supposed, for Mr. Pocket to come out to us, at any rate we waited there, and so I had an opportunity of observing the remarkable family phenomenon that whenever any of the children strayed near Mrs. Pocket in their play, they always tripped themselves up and tumbled over her always very much to her momentary astonishment and their own more enduring lamentation. I was at a loss to account for this surprising circumstance, and could not help giving my mind to speculations about it, until by and by Millers came down with the baby, which baby was handed to Flopson, which Flopson was handing it to Mrs. Pocket, when she too went fairly head foremost over Mrs. Pocket, baby, and all, and was caught by Herbert and myself. Gracious me, flop son, said Mrs. Pocket, looking off her book for a moment, everybody's tumbling. Gracious you, indeed, mum. Returned flop son, very red in the face, what have you got there? I got here, flop son. Asked Mrs. Pocket. Why, if it ain't your footstool cried Flop Son. And if you keep it under your skirts like that, who's to help tumbling? Here. Take the baby, mum, and give me your book. Mrs. Pocket acted on the advice, and inexpertly danced the infant a little in her lap, while the other children played about it. This had lasted but a very short time, when Mrs.
Pocket issued summary orders that they were all to be taken into the house for a nap. Thus I made the second discovery on that first occasion, that the nurture of the little pockets consisted of alternately tumbling up and lying down. Under these circumstances, when Flopson and Millers had got Charles Dickens' Elec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations Charles Dickens' Elec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations MMR. Pocket said he was glad to see me, and he hoped I was not sorry to see him. For, I really am not, he added, with his son's smile, an alarming personage. He was a young-looking man, in spite of his perplexities and his very grey hair, and his manner seemed quite natural. I use the word natural, in the sense of its being unaffected, there was something comic in his distraught way as though it would have been downright ludicrous but for his own perception that it was very near being so. When he had talked with me a little, he said to MRS. Pocket, with a rather anxious contraction of his eyebrows, which were black and handsome, Belinda, I hope you have welcomed MR. Pib. And she looked up from her book, and said, Yes. She then smiled upon me in an absent state of mind and asked me if I liked the taste of orange flower water? As the question had no bearing, near or remote, on any foregone or subsequent transaction, I consider it to have been thrown out, like her previous approaches, in general conversational condescension. I found out within a few hours, and may mention at once, that MRS. Pocket was the only daughter of a certain quite accidental deceased knight who had invented for himself a conviction that his deceased father would have been made a baronet but for somebody's determined opposition arising out of entirely personal motives I forget whose, if I ever knew the sovereigns, the prime ministers, the lord chancellors, the archbishop of Canterbury's, anybody's and had tacked himself on to the nobles of the earth in right of this quite supposititious fact. I believe he Charles Dickens' Elec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations so successful a watch and ward had been established over the young lady by this judicious parent, that she had grown up highly ornamental, but perfectly helpless and useless. With her character thus happily formed, in the first bloom of her youth she had encountered Mr. Pocket, who was also in the first bloom of youth and not quite decided whether to mount to the woolsack, or to roof himself in with a mitre. As his doing the one or the other was a mere question of time, he and MRS. Pocket had taken time by the forelock, when, to judge from its length, it would seem to have wanted cutting, and had married without the knowledge of the judicious parent. The judicious parent, having nothing to bestow or withhold but his blessing, had handsomely settled that dower upon them after a short struggle, and had informed M.R. Pocket that his wife was a treasure for a prince. M.R. Pocket had invested the prince's treasure in the ways of the world ever since, and it was supposed to have brought him in but indifferent interest. Still, M.R.S. Pocket was in general the object of a queer sort of respectful pity, because she had not married a title, while M.R. Pocket was the object of a queer sort of forgiving reproach, because he had never got one. M.R. Pocket took me into the house and showed me my room. Charles Dickens' Elec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations Looking young man of a heavy order of architecture, was whistling. Startop, younger in years and appearance, was reading and holding his head, as if he thought himself in danger of exploding it with too strong a charge of knowledge. Both M.R. and M.R.S. Pocket had such a noticeable air of being in somebody else's hands, that I wondered who really was in possession of the house and let them live there, until I found this unknown power to be the servants. It was a smooth way of going on, perhaps, in respect of saving trouble, but it had the appearance of being expensive for the servants felt it a duty they owed to themselves to be nice in their eating and drinking, and to keep a deal of company downstairs. They allowed a very liberal table to M.R. and M.R.S. Pocket, 
yet it always appeared to me that by far the best part of the house to have boarded in, would have been the kitchen always supposing the boarder capable of self-defense, for, before I had been there a week, a neighboring lady with whom the family were personally unacquainted, wrote in to say that she had seen Miller slapping the baby. This greatly distressed MRS. Pocket, who burst into tears on receiving the note, and said that it was an extraordinary thing that the neighbors couldn't mind their own business. By degrees I learned, and chiefly from Herbert, that Mr. Pocket had been educated at Harrow and at Cambridge, where he had distinguished himself, but that when he had had the happiness of marrying Mrs. Pocket very early in life, he had impaired his Charles Dickens Elec book classics Great Expectations Great Expectations Mr. An MRS. Pocket had a toady neighbor, a widow lady of that highly sympathetic nature that she agreed with everybody, blessed everybody, and shed smiles and tears on everybody, according to circumstances. This lady's name was MRS. Coiler, and I had the honor of taking her down to dinner on the day of my installation. She gave me to understand on the stairs, that it was a blow to dear MRS. Pocket that dear Mr. Pocket should be under the necessity of receiving gentlemen to read with him. That did not extend to me, she told me in a gush of love and confidence, at that time, I had known her something less than five minutes, if they were all like me, it would be quite another thing. But dear Mrs. Pocket, said Mrs. Coiler, after her early disappointment, not that dear Mr. Pocket was to blame in that, requires so much luxury and elegance yes, ma'am, I said, to stop her, for I was afraid she was going to cry. And she is of so aristocratic a disposition yes, ma'am, I said again, with the same object as before. Charles Dickens' Elec book classics Great Expectations Great Expectations I could not help thinking that it might be harder if the butcher's time and attention were diverted from dear M.R.S. Pocket, but I said nothing, and indeed had enough to do in keeping a bashful watch upon my company manners. It came to my knowledge, through what passed between M.R.S. Pocket and Drummle while I was attentive to my knife and fork, spoon, glasses, and other instruments of self-destruction, that Drummle, whose Christian name was Bentley, was actually the next heir but one to a baronetcy. It further appeared that the book I had seen M.R.S. Pocket reading in the garden, was all about titles, and that she knew the exact date at which her grandpapa would have come into the book, if he ever had come at all. Drummle didn't say much, but in his limited way, he struck me as a sulky kind of fellow, he spoke as one of the elect, and recognized M.R.S. Pocket as a woman and a sister. No one but themselves and M.R.S. Coiler the toady neighbor showed any interest in this part of the conversation, and it appeared to me that it was painful to Herbert, but it promised to last a long time, when the page came in with the announcement of a domestic affliction. It was, in effect, that the cook had mislaid the beef. To my unutterable amazement, I now, for the first time, saw Mr. Pocket relieve his mind by going through a performance that struck me as very extraordinary, but which made no impression on anybody else, and with which I soon became as familiar as the rest. He laid down the carving knife and fork being engaged in carving, at the moment put his two hands into his disturbed hair and appeared to make an extraordinary effort to lift himself up by it. When he had done this, Charles Dickens' Elec book classics Great Expectations Great Expectations MRS. Coiler then changed the subject, and began to flatter me. I liked it for a few moments, but she flattered me so very grossly that the pleasure was soon over. She had a serpentine way of coming close at me when she pretended to be vitally interested in the friends and localities I had left, which was altogether snaky and fork-tongued, and when she made an occasional bounce upon Startop, who said very little to her, or upon Drummle, who said less, I rather envied them for being on the opposite side of the table.
After dinner the children were introduced, an MRS. Coiler made admiring comments on their eyes, noses, and legs a sagacious way of improving their minds. There were four little girls, and two little boys, besides the baby who might have been either, and the baby's next successor who was as yet neither. They were brought in by Flopson and Millers, much as though those two non-commissioned officers had been recruiting somewhere for children and had enlisted these. While M.R.S. Pocket looked at the young nobles that ought to have been, as if she rather thought she had had the pleasure of inspecting them before, but didn't quite know what to make of them. Here. Give me your fork, Mum, and take the baby, said Flop Son. Don't take it that way, or you'll get its head under the table. Thus advised, M.R.S. Pocket took it the other way, and got its head upon the table, which was announced to all present by a prodigious concussion. Dear, dear. Give it me back, Mum, said Flop Son, and Miss Charles Dickens' Elec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations One of the Little Girls, a mere mite who seemed to have prematurely taken upon herself some charge of the others, stepped out of her place by me, and danced to and from the baby until it left off crying, and laughed. Then, all the children laughed, and M.R. Pocket, who in the meantime had twice endeavoured to lift himself up by the hair, laughed, and we all laughed and were glad. Flop son, by dint of doubling the baby at the joints like a Dutch doll, then got it safely into M.R.S. Pocket's lap, and gave it the nutcrackers to play with. At the same time recommending M.R.S. Pocket to take notice that the handles of that instrument were not likely to agree with its eyes, and sharply charging Miss Jane to look after the same. Then, the two nurses left the room, and had a lively scuffle on the staircase with a dissipated page who had waited at dinner, and who had clearly lost half his buttons at the gaming table. I was made very uneasy in my mind by M.R.S. Pockets falling into a discussion with Drummle respecting two baronet seas, while she ate a sliced orange steeped in sugar and wine, and forgetting all about the baby on her lap. Who did most appalling things with the nutcrackers? At length, little Jane perceiving its young brains to be imperiled, softly left her place, and with many small artifices coaxed the dangerous weapon away. MRS. Pocket finishing her orange at about the same time, and not approving of this, said to Jane. You naughty child, how dare you? Go and sit down this instant. Mama dear, lisped the little girl, baby who'd have put hith Charles Dickens' Elec book classics great expectations great expectations how dare you tell me so? Retorted MRS. Pocket. Go and sit down in your chair this moment. MRS. Pocket's dignity was so crushing, that I felt quite abashed. As if I myself had done something to rouse it. Belinda, remonstrated MR. Pocket, from the other end of the table, how can you be so unreasonable? Jane only interfered for the protection of baby. I will not allow anybody to interfere, said MRS. Pocket. I am surprised, Matthew, that you should expose me to the affront of interference. Good God! cried M.R. Pocket, in an outbreak of desolate desperation. Are infants to be nutcrackered into their tombs, and is nobody to save them? I will not be interfered with by Jane, said M.R.S. Pocket, with a majestic glance at that innocent little offender. I hope I know my poor grandpapa's position. Jane, indeed. M.R. Pocket got his hands in his hair again, and this time really did lift himself some inches out of his chair. Hear this! He helplessly exclaimed to the elements. Babies are to be nutcrackered dead, for people's poor grandpapa's positions. Then he let himself down again, and became silent. We all looked awkwardly at the tablecloth while this was going on. A pause succeeded, 
during which the honest and irrepressible baby made a series of leaps and crows at little Jane, who appeared to me to be the only member of the family, irrespective of servants, with whom it had any decided acquaintance. Mr. Drummle, said Mrs. Pocket, will you ring for Flop Son? Jane, you undutiful little thing, go and lie down. Now, baby Charles Dickens' Alec Book Classics Great Expectations Great Expectations The baby was the soul of honor, and protested with all its might. It doubled itself up the wrong way over Mrs. Pocket's arm, exhibited a pair of knitted shoes and dimpled ankles to the company in lieu of its soft face, and was carried out in the highest state of mutiny. And it gained its point after all, for I saw it through the window within a few minutes, being nursed by little Jane. It happened that the other five children were left behind at the dinner table, through flop sons having some private engagement, and there not being anybody else's business. I thus became aware of the mutual relations between them and Mr. Pocket, which were exemplified in the following manner. Mr. Pocket, with the normal perplexity of his face heightened and his hair rumpled, looked at them for some minutes, as if he couldn't make out how they came to be boarding and lodging in that establishment, and why they hadn't been billeted by nature on somebody else. Audiobook generated by, Read with the Ears.